Section 4 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 8, Part 2, Veninka by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 4 Well, here we are alone, said Gregory. What do you mean to do? Well, what would you say, replied Ivan, if in spite of the late hour and the cold, and in spite of the fact that we are only slaves, my lady were to leave her father's house and come to drink our healths. I would say that you ought to take advantage of it, said Gregory, shrugging his shoulders, and to tell her to bring at the same time a bottle of brandy. There is probably better brandy in the general's cellar than in mine. There is better said ivan as if he was perfectly sure of it and my lady shall bring you a bottle of it you are mad said gregory he is mad repeated the other two slaves mechanically oh am i mad said ivan well will you take the wager what will you wager two hundred roubles against a year of free drinking in your inn done said gregory are your comrades included said the two moujiks they are included said ivan and in consideration of them we will reduce the time to six months is that agreed it is agreed said gregory the two who were making the wager shook hands and the agreement was perfected. Then, with an air of confidence, assumed to confound the witnesses of this strange scene, Ivan wrapped himself in the fur coat, which, like a cautious man, he had spread on the stove and went out. At the end of half an hour he reappeared. "'Well!' cried Gregory and the two slaves together. "'She is following,' said Ivan. Uh, the three tipplers looked at one another in amazement, but Ivan quietly returned to his place in the middle of them, poured out a new bumper, and raising his glass, cried, "'To my lady's health! It is the least we can do, and she is kind enough to come and join us on so cold a night, when the snow is falling fast!' "'Anushka,' said a voice outside, "'knock at this door and ask Gregory if he has not some of our servants with him.' Gregory and the two other slaves looked at one another, stupefied. They had recognized Vaninka's voice. As for Ivan, he flung himself back in his chair, balancing himself with marvelous impertinence. Anushka opened the door, and they could see, as Ivan had said, that the snow was falling heavily. "'Yes, madame,' said the girl. "'My brother is there with Daniel and Alexis.' Vaninka entered. "'My friends?' said she with a strange smile. "'I am told that you were drinking my health, and I have come to bring you something to drink it again. Here is a bottle of old French brandy which I have chosen for you from my father's cellar. Hold out your glasses.' Gregory and the slaves obeyed with the slowness and hesitation of astonishment, while Ivan held out his glass with the utmost effrontery. Vaninka filled them to the brim herself, and then, as they hesitated to drink, "'Come, drink to my health, friends,' said she. "'Hurrah!' cried the drinkers, reassured by the kind and familiar tone of their noble visitor, as they emptied their glasses at a draught. Vaninka at once poured them out another glass, then putting the bottle on the table. "'Empty the bottle, my friends,' said she, "'and do not trouble about me.' Anushka and I, with the permission to 668 of the master of the house, will sit near the stove till the storm is over. Gregory tried to rise and place stools near the stove, but whether he was quite drunk or whether some narcotic had been mixed with the brandy, he fell back on his seat, trying to stammer out an excuse. It is all right, said Vaninka. Do not disturb yourselves. Drink, my friends. Drink. The revellers profited by this permission, and each emptied the glass before him. 
Scarcely had Gregory emptied his before he fell forward on the table. Good, said Vaninka to her maid in a low voice. The opium is taking effect. What do you mean to do? said Anushka. You will soon see, was the answer. The two moujiks followed the example of the master of the house and fell down side by side on the ground. Ivan was left struggling against sleep and trying to sing a drinking song, but soon his tongue refused to obey him. His eyes closed in spite of him, and seeking the tune that escaped him in muttering words he was unable to pronounce, he fell fast asleep near his companions. Immediately Vaninka rose, fixed them with flashing eyes, and called them by name, one after another. There was no response. Then she clapped her hands and cried joyfully the moment has come going to the back of the room she brought thence an armful of straw placed it in a corner of the room and did the same in the other corners she then took a flaming brand from the stove and set fire in succession to the four corners of the room what are you doing said anushka wild with terror trying to stop her i am going to bury our secret in the ashes of this house answered vaninka but my brother my poor brother said the girl your brother is a wretch who has betrayed me and we are lost if we do not destroy him oh my brother my poor brother you can die with him if you like said vaninka accompanying the proposal with a smile which showed she would not have been sorry if anushka had carried sisterly affection to that length but look at the fire madame the fire let us go then said vaninka and dragging out the heart-broken girl she locked the door behind her and threw the key far away into the snow in the name of heaven said anushka let us go home quickly i cannot gaze upon this awful sight no let us stay here said vaninka holding her back with a grasp of almost masculine strength let us stay until the house falls in on them so that we may be certain that not one of them escapes oh my god cried anushka falling on her knees have mercy upon my poor brother for death will hurry him unprepared into thy presence yes yes pray that is right said vaninka i wish to destroy their bodies not their souls vaninka stood motionless her arms crossed, brilliantly lit up by the flames, while her attendant prayed. The fire did not last long. The house was wooden, with the crevices filled with oakum, like all those of Russian peasants, so that the flames creeping out at the four corners soon made great headway, and fanned by the wind spread rapidly to all parts of the building. Vaninka followed the progress of the fire with blazing eyes, fearing to see some half-burnt spectral shape rush out of the flames. At last the roof fell in, and Vaninka relieved of all fear, then at last made her way to the general's house, into which the two women entered without being seen, thanks to the permission Anushka had to go out at any hour of the day or night. The next morning, the sole topic of conversation in St. Petersburg was the fire at the Red House. Four half-consumed corpses were dug out from beneath the ruins, and as three of the general's slaves were missing— he had no doubt the unrecognizable bodies were those of Ivan, Daniel, and Alexis. As for the fourth, it was certainly that of Gregory. The cause of the fire remained a secret from everyone. The house was solitary and the snowstorm so violent that nobody had met the two women on the deserted road. Vaninka was sure of her maid. Her secret then had perished with Ivan. But now remorse took the place of fear. The young girl, who was so pitiless and inflexible in the execution of the deed, quailed at its remembrance. It seemed to her that by revealing the secret of her crime to a priest, she would be relieved of her terrible burden. She therefore sought a confessor renowned for his lofty charity, and under the seal of confession told him all. The priest was horrified by the story. A divine mercy is boundless, but human forgiveness has its limits. He refused Vaninka the absolution she asked. This refusal was terrible. It would banish Vaninka from the holy table. This banishment would be noticed and could not fail to be attributed to some unheard of and secret crime. Vaninka fell at the feet of the priest 
and in the name of her father, who would be disgraced by her shame, begged him to mitigate the rigor of his sentence. The confessor reflected deeply, then thought he had found a way to obviate such consequences. It was that Vaninka should approach the holy table with the other young girls. The priest would stop before her as before all the others, but only say to her, "'Pray and weep!' The congregation, deceived by this, would think that she had received the sacrament like her companions. This was all that Vaninka could obtain. This confession took place about seven o'clock in the evening, and the solitude of the church, added to the darkness of night, had given it a still more awful character. The confessor returned home, pale and trembling. His wife, Elizabeth, was waiting for him alone. She had just put her little daughter, Arena, who was eight years old, to bed in an adjoining room. When she saw her husband, she uttered a cry of terror. So changed and haggard was his appearance. And the confessor tried to reassure her, but his trembling voice only increased her alarm. She asked the cause of his agitation. The confessor refused to tell her. Elizabeth had heard the evening before that her mother was ill. She thought that her husband had received some bad news. The day was Monday, which is considered an unlucky day among the Russians, and going out that day, Elizabeth had met a man in mourning. These omens were too numerous and too strong not to portend misfortune. Elizabeth burst into tears and cried out, "'My mother is dead!' The priest in vain tried to reassure her by telling her that this agitation was not due to that. The poor woman, dominated by one idea, made no response to his protestations but this everlasting cry, "'My mother is dead!' Then, to bring her to reason, the confessor told her that this emotion was due to the avowal of a crime which she had just heard in the confessional. But Elizabeth shook her head. It was a trick, she said, to hide from her the sorrow which had fallen upon her. Her agony, instead of calming, became more violent. Her tears ceased to flow and were followed by hysterics. The priest then made her swear to keep the secret, and the sanctity of the confession was betrayed. Little Arena had awakened at Elizabeth's cries, and being disturbed and at the same time curious as to what her parents were doing, she got up, went to listen at the door, and heard all. The day for the communion came. The church of St. Simeon was crowded. Vaninka came to kneel at the railing of the choir. Behind her was her father and his aide-de-camp, and behind them their servants. Arena was also in the church with her mother. The inquisitive child wished to see Vaninka, whose name she had heard pronounced that terrible night, when her father had failed in the first and most sacred of the duties imposed on a priest. While her mother was praying, she left her chair and glided among the worshippers nearly as far as the railing. But when she had arrived there, she was stopped by the group of the general's servants, but Arena had not come so far to be stopped so easily. She tried to push between them, but they opposed her. She persisted, and one of them pushed her roughly back. The child fell, struck her head against a seat, and got up bleeding and crying. "'You are very proud for a slave. Is it because you belong to the great lady who burnt the red house?' These words, uttered in a loud voice in the midst of the silence which preceded the sacred ceremony, were heard by every one. They were answered by a shriek. Vaninka had fainted. The next day the general at the feet of Paul recounted to him as his sovereign and judge the whole terrible story, which Vaninka, crushed by her long struggle, had at last revealed to him at night after the scene in the church. The emperor remained for a moment in thought at the end of this strange confession. Then, getting up from the chair where he had been sitting while the miserable father told his story, he went to a bureau and wrote on a sheet of paper the following sentence. The priest, having violated what should have been inviolable, the secrets of the confessional, is exiled to Siberia and deprived of his priestly office. His wife will follow him. She is to be blamed for not having respected his character as a minister of the altar. The little girl will not leave her parents. Anushka, the attendant, will also go to Siberia for not having made known to her master his daughter's conduct. I preserve all my esteem for the general, and I mourn with him for the deadly blow which has struck him. As for Vaninka, I know of no punishment which can be inflicted upon her. I only see in her the daughter of a brave soldier, whose whole life has been devoted to the service of his country. Besides, the extraordinary way in which the crime was discovered seems to place the culprit beyond the limits of my severity. I leave her punishment in her own hands. If I understand her character, 
if any feeling of dignity remains to her her heart and her remorse will show her the path she ought to follow paul handed the paper open to the general ordering him to take it to count pollen the governor of st petersburg on the following day the emperor's orders were carried out vaninka went into a convent where towards the end of the same year she died of shame and grief the general found the death he sought on the field of austerlitz end of section four end of celebrated crimes volume eight part two vaninka by alexandre dumas translated by george burnham ives read by john van stan savannah georgia